I think it was just about a year ago that I was standing right in this very place. At that point, I was at the beginning of what was two months of touring in India, just starting in this city. Now I'm in the middle of the second round. It's really been a, a wonderful experience for me to travel. Um, among other things, I was saying to Haridas in Roma, given the responsibilities that I normally carry at home for a whole center and for a community and for all the enterprises that we have, it's actually very relaxing just to be traveling <laughs> because all I have to do is this um, and nothing else. And so it's a great opportunity to be friends, to have heart to heart and soul to soul connections with people that I may not know in any other way except in our relationship in God and our relationship in Guru. It's also been just fascinating to see Master's family spreading and watching the way that one candle lights another, lights another, lights another. In our temple in Palo Alto, where I'm from, every Sunday we do the Festival of Light, which I know you do sometimes here, and we have a tall, I was looking to see, they're all small, we have a tall candle which we call the Noble Taper of Inner Communion. It has quite a fancy name and it's a candle like this. And as the line in the Festival of Light, we say, gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. And it's just one tall candle with one flame. And our temple is really quite large. It used to be a Catholic church, but they didn't have enough priests, so they sold it to us. I think it's very symbolic. It's like the old way is giving way to the new way. So now St. Aloysius Catholic Church is Ananda Church of Self-Realization. But God bless them. They built this beautiful sanctuary with a big high ceiling. If you haven't seen the Finding Happiness movie, our temple flashes through there a few times. The point only of its size is this, that we can stand in the front holding one candle with one flame, with the flame showing, which is a little stronger. Wherever you are in that temple, which of course is, it's not as big as an airport, it's just bigger than this room, you can see that candle flame. And it's always surprising to me how dynamic that flame is, even though it's really very small. And there's also the factor, and we do as part of the ceremony, we all light individual arati candles off of that big candle. And there is a characteristic about fire, which is it can give itself away over and over again, and it's never diminished. It's just one tiny candle flame can ignite millions of other candles, and it will still burn. The other factor about that single candle flame, which we think about sometimes, is it could destroy the whole building. Just that little tiny flame in the wrong place at the wrong time, and no matter how big and beautiful that building is, it could all be turned to ash. In fact, um, many years ago in 19, the summer of 1971, Haridas was already at Ananda Village. I actually, actually the summer of 1970, I came a little later. Our temple did burn down. And we had a dome temple that, um, I say we, I wasn't there yet, but I still say we, had built with a great deal of care and energy. Somebody meditated late at night, left a candle burning. <coughs> it was not burning in anything that protected it. And one tiny candle flame took the whole building to the ground, which was a major setback at the time because it had taken tremendous energy to have it there. Well, the positive side of all of this reality about a single light and holding up that light, gaze upon this light as a symbol of God's love. And I, I, all of that I'm saying is the way over 25 years of almost weekly repeating those lines, what does it mean for it to be a symbol of God's love? Well, many and all of the things that I'm saying, from any direction, it's vivid. In absolute darkness, 
it can be seen, it can be passed on endlessly without ever being diminished, it has the power to transform. If we think about it burning down a building, we think of that as being destructive. If we think about it burning away our attachments, burning away our egos, burning away our suffering, burning away our delusions, then we just realize that that little tiny candle flame can change me into something else. In our movie, which as I said some of you may have seen or will see this weekend, we talk about 1976, 1976, five years later, six years later, when in fact fire did come and burn down a great deal of our community. We had 900 acres and 450 of them burned. Um, I was on a radio interview and for the movie, for the Finding Happiness movie, we're publicizing it. And she said, you must have been through so many hard things building Ananda. And she mentioned the fire that must have been so difficult for you to go through. I said, and I meant it truthfully, oh, the fire wasn't hard, the fire was fun. Just like that. And even at the time, it was really fun because this incredible force that was just so much bigger than our opinions. I remember standing on this hilltop with Joe Tish, and, and in the movie you sort of see it, you can't really tell exactly, but I was standing on this hilltop with Joe Tish. We're looking at this fire. It's downhill from us, and the wind is behind it. Um, wildfires are something we know in that area. When, it's, when the fire is downhill burning uphill, which is how it usually burns, all the hot air goes in advance and it, it dries out all the fuel that's in front of it. All that heat just vaporizes whatever moisture there might be and it preheats the fuel. So a fire that's burning uphill with wind behind it is almost unstoppable. And it was, that's what we were looking at. And just, we're just standing here you know, you never think it's going to happen to you. Hmm. I said, that fire looks like it's going to burn down our community. Joe Tish says, yeah, it really does. <laughs> it was just like, wow, this is actually going to happen. And then it did. And it, it came up the hill and we were trained um, to fight fires in a very small way. And we had these little cotton jackets that we all put on, these little blue cotton jackets with a little oriental collar. And this was during the Vietnam War. So we were wearing these blue oriental looking things that looked just vaguely like the uniforms that the Viet Cong wore. We're all dressed alike in all this smoke. It was a very where am I kind of moment. <laughs> but we're in there with our little pumps thinking we're going to stop this fire. I mean, we're just kids with rakes and a little bit of water like this and this thing boom up the mountain like that, just huge. And it jumped over us. We were standing there. It just went right over our heads. And all of a sudden, your fire is on both sides of you. I mean, you have to be really stupid to stay there at that point. So we all ran and then we watched it. And all of our houses were in a very heavily wooded area. We were not very fire smart. We've gotten smarter. And the fire went to the base of a tree, a very tall tree, and burned right up the top of the tree, just like that, like this, like a firecracker. Then it starts going from the tops of the trees. That's a fire phenomenon called tree topping. And you know, it's 50 feet in the air, just going across like a train. And yes, it was terrible. But on the other hand, it was so magnificent to realize just how little we are in the great scheme of things. That if God, Guru, and Mother Nature desire to change, everything will change. I was in an earthquake in California where I live, Palo Alto, near San Francisco. No, it was 1989, quite a few years ago. Those of you who remember might have seen pictures of the part of the bridge in San Francisco falling. It was very dramatic and it you know, was repeated a thousand times on every television station. Whoop, bridge falling, big deal. I'm in our community in the little wooden buildings that we have, not, not brick like this, but wooden. The building is just going like this. Earthquakes are short, but they're, they're dramatic. It's going like this. 
The first thing that crosses my mind is the phrase, earthquake proof is not true. There's no such thing. <laughs> if God wants to knock it down, he will knock it down. You can do anything you want. He just has to shake it long enough and it's coming down. So I'm watching it like this, and the mind is so funny at such a moment. I think the problem is the building. There's something wrong with the building, I think. So I'll step outside, and it was a ground floor apartment and it wasn't far to step outside, so in a matter of seconds, I'm outside. I'm in the big grassy area of our community. And oddly, it's not the problem with the building, it's the problem with the whole planet. And the whole planet is going like this. You know, I'm watching the ground undulate. I'm watching the trees go like this. I'm watching the water in the swimming pool that we have there come up over the fence like this and just kind of shoot across onto the lawn. All of this is 90 seconds, but a very memorable 90 seconds. And once again, I'm just thinking, it's like we take all this for granted. I mean, it was so, mentally it was so odd that there was no place where it wasn't happening. Every place I was, it was happening. Indoors, outdoors, over there, over here. It's like all the little systems that we keep in place that we're so careful about. God just laughs. Now, it took me longer in the earthquake than I'm proud to admit to go to the Om Guru part. <laughs> I did a lot of oh my God, but not in a really devotional way, just what is happening before it occurred to me that maybe I should take refuge in the Om. First it was just looking for refuge in an outward way. I mean, these are two moments over 40 years of time, but nonetheless, all of them illustrate a very simple fact that we live at the discretion of the divine. And our time here is really so much in his hands. I mean, everything else we're doing, it's just all in his hands. I was at Ananda village many years ago when I lived there. Things were, um, we used many buildings and things that were only half finished and it was, it was very primitive living. Those of you who've been to Pune community, you know, it's coming up. Pieces of it are done, pieces of it are not done. That was what we all lived with for a long time. And I was working in the office building and there were lots of creatures that lived there with us, rats and mice and sometimes raccoons and bats lived behind the pictures and it was just the way it was because we couldn't seal it up all that well. And this was a very small thing. I'm sitting at my desk and there's this tiny spider and he was a very spunky fellow. I, I just, he had a lot of personality for such a small creature. And he was, this was before computers, so he was actually on my typewriter. He's running from side to side on my typewriter. He's crawling up on the lever and he's kind of, you know, surveying the whole scene and then deciding to come down, run across the space bar, take up his position on the shift key and just really having a big experience. And I began to think how this spider was completely under my control and that even though he seemed so full of life and had so much of a destiny that at the least whim on my part, that would be the end of the spider. He would reincarnate somewhere else, right? I'm sitting there. I didn't crush him and I didn't want to. I was just sort of playing. And all of a sudden I had this really strong sense of, of somebody above me <laughs> with a thumb who had watched me come to work, watched me come to the office, <laughs> was watching me run around and was thinking at any moment, <laughs> you know, and I would have to reincarnate somewhere else. <laughs> I, I think ideas like this, however they come to us, are really vitally important because otherwise incarnations go by and we never actually stop and think, what is the point of this whole thing? Am I just a little spider running from point to point and then at some time I'll be finished with this body and it'll be gone? You know, am I just looking at this candle as a symbol of God's love or am I somehow taking that into myself? 
Do I look with enthusiasm at the possibility that that little symbol of God's love could ignite a forest fire within me and I could really become completely someone else? I mean, and an up, up, uplifted and expanded someone else? You know, why am I here? And how do I fulfill my purpose? I've enjoyed, of course, um, over the years, the opportunities I've had to be with Swami Kriyananda, which by the grace of God have been quite a few and quite varied over all the years. And naturally, the moments when he stands in front of a, a room full of devotees and just opens the floodgates of his consciousness, uh, such times are moments in eternity. And we've all had at least a few. But what, what also has been fascinating for me as, is to watch how he behaves as a disciple of Master at all times. I think just the, the definition of his own life as a disciple was so utterly integrated that there was no time in his life when he took a holiday from that reality. I've written elsewhere, and I believe it's true, that I don't think a single day of his life went by that he didn't do something creative and serviceful on behalf of Master's work. If we were on vacation, if he was uh, in the hospital having heart surgery, wherever he was, whatever was happening, he never lost contact with the fact that he was on this planet to serve God. He tells the story of one of his early, one of the early years in India. When he arrived in India in 2003, almost immediately this very intense physical tapasya, which happened intermittently through the, the, all the years, the last 10 years of his life, often in this country, he became very familiar with quite a few Indian hospitals. In those first years in Gorgaon, he would go to the little hospital, which was called Privat Hospital, which was just up the road. I happened to be visiting. I've never been assigned to India, but I've been in and out quite a lot to see Swami. And I happened to be with him on one of the times when he was developing, it sounds really terrible, and it's actually pretty serious, congestive heart failure, which actually means the heart isn't working all that well. And in his case, it would show up because his lower limbs would begin to swell because the fluid could not be pumped properly. And the only way they could get it down was to get him into the hospital to force him to lie down, to put his feet up, and to stop working. And I just happened to be there one of the times when they took him to the hospital. They walked in and they kind of waved at the nurses and doctors, agreed that Swami would take his regular room. <laughs> And he would just go up to his regular room and kind of crawl into bed. He was so uh, familiar with doing that. But it didn't matter where he was. It didn't matter in, in one of the times most seriously when he had double pneumonia and they had to carry him downstairs to the hospital. And you've heard him tell this story. And he's nearly, literally, nearly dead. And a doctor asks for his advice. How can I earn enough money honestly in this country to take care of my family? And Swamiji tells him, you know, that the, the practice of my guru's teachings will, is, is the answer. Although Swamiji said he was hardly a good example at that moment of the teachings. <laughs> he was barely conscious and could hardly move, but he was still behaving as a disciple. And then from that hospital bed, he dictated the beginning of the material success course. And that just, that was just the way he was. There was never a moment. I often went to him with him to Goa for, in January to get out of the cold in, in uh, the Delhi area. I think at least half of those trips he was editing a book. And often it was a book that we didn't really write. It's like randomly some, somebody else had compiled a book or had shown him something and it needed more work. And I would get up early and I would type in his changes and he would write. At least half the vacation he would spend working. He never stopped. My favorite was being in the Ohm bookstore in the Metro Mall over here in uh, Gorgon, actually. But where, that was where he was living. And he wasn't dressed in his orange robe, I don't believe, that day. I think he had on a Western jacket. We're standing in the metaphysical spiritual book section of the store, and some random stranger pulls autobiography of a yogi off the shelf. 
Swami sees him and he goes right up to him, just like a child. I was his disciple, Swami says like that. I lived with him the last three and a half years of his life. He was the most wonderful man. I mean, this poor total stranger has just taken the book off the shelf. <laughs> As I recall, the man did not take what Swami said in the spirit in which it was intended. But I took a very deep lesson from it, which is, why not? Why not always see ourselves as here to serve our master? Swami was so free in that. He was, he was always ready to declare himself. Whenever I see Haridas, of course, I start thinking about some of the wacky adventures we had when we were much younger. My favorite being when Swamiji had a program to do in Reno, Nevada. Reno is not quite as bad as Las Vegas, but it's kind of Las Vegas' little brother. It's, it's real close to that. Gambling and a variety of unsavory things. At the same time, it's kind of a high desert. And it also attracts metaphysicians and psychics and people with expanded awareness. So we had a group there, and Swami took us there to give this program. And he wanted us to publicize his program. Uh, this is like about 1972 or 73. And I know Haridas and I were there in a whole other crowd. And he thought, Swami thought it would be a good idea for us to dress in Indian clothes in Reno, Nevada, and go to the local um, Kmart is what it was. It's the equivalent of Walmart or some big store like that. Sit on the sidewalk and chant. <laughs> to say that this was an unlikely thing to do in that place is putting it exceedingly mildly. Um, I, Haridas and I remember the experience differently. <laughs> he, he, he's used the word mortified at <laughs> different times. <laughs> I just remember it as being just so outrageous that it was so much fun to just be doing something absolutely nuts. But I think about it in retrospect. And I, you read about Master pushing some of his disciples, making Dr. Lewis energize on the lawn of the hotel. You know, just because other people don't do it, why should you be embarrassed? You're doing a good thing. And why would we not just stand up and say, I am a disciple? Now, I think Swamiji was trying to break us of what Sri Yukteswar describes in the holy science as one of the eight meannesses of the heart. One of the eight meannesses of the heart that Sri Yukteswar describes is too narrow a sense of respectability. Isn't that an interesting one? Too narrow a sense of respectability. Diamata tells the story of Master having them all dressed in sorrows and making them saris, and making them eat big pieces of watermelon without any utensils out on the side of the road. All these young girls and you know, watermelon, big watermelon, you just put your face in it and it's just all over you. And he made them stand on the road in their saris and eat watermelon. Too narrow a sense of respectability. Why do I have to live within these narrow confines? Well, as disciples, I don't think it's necessary. I mean, I could, there's no way you could dress in Indian clothes in Bangalore and stand out like we did. <laughs> so I'm trying to think we couldn't even put you in Western clothes and have you stand out. And even here, you could chant on the streets and it would be odd, but not as peculiar as when we did it. But what Swami was trying to say is give your heart, give your heart to this work and be very joyful and open in how you give it away to others. You know, this, it's such an unusual thing that we're doing. In 1920, Yogananda left India. He took a boat to Boston. And in those early years, he lived in a little room, more or less by himself. He met Dr. Lewis right away. He began to gather a few disciples to himself. He was getting used as he put it, to the American culture, to the English language, and just all by himself there. He just began to move. He began to teach a few classes here, a few classes there. Then he got a, 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 an automobile and he started driving across the country and giving lectures here and lectures there. 
And on one hand, we have this thought in our mind, oh, well, he was an avatar, just like that. He could do that sort of thing. And of course, there is power there. But even the avatars, when they assume a physical personality, they actually enter into the conditions of this world. And they show us, by the way they live, how to work with the conditions of this world. How to use our willpower, our devotion to God, the power of the Guru working through us. Even though we think of Master as the apex of, of our own idea of devotion, he turned his attention to Sri Yukteswar and to Babaji. And he didn't do that just out of a lack of awareness of his own spiritual nature. He did it because he was showing us how to live in the conditions of this world. So much of autobiography, it's fascinating, you know, when you've read it once, twice, 10, 12, 20 times. Each time you read it, it sort of speaks to you from another angle. And most recently when I was reading it, I was deeply conscious of how much of that book is about discipleship. And on one hand, you, you know, as Swamiji said later, that Master was just presenting himself as a humble devotee. And he, but on the other hand, he knew what he was doing in that book, and he knew the role that book would play. And yes, of course, we pick we, we, we draw through it this extraordinary vibration of Yogananda's own vibration. But Sri Yukteswar and Babaji, especially for many people, Babaji, many people in the first reading of that book hardly notice Master but remember Babaji vividly. And Master was doing that on purpose. He was a disciple. He was giving the attention and the credit and the power to the source of his own reality and he was living it wholeheartedly even in the little interchanges where Sri Yukteswar sent him to college to sent him back to finish his, finish his exams at college even when he didn't want to <coughs> and Master declares to, to Sri Yukteswar I'm going to fill the pages of my exam books with your teachings and then in fact he's given the opportunity to do so even in the exam and he fills the pages of his exam book with his guru's teachings. He, he witnesses for it. He, he pours it out. He never forgets who he is and where he is and why he's here. And, you know, many of us in this particular time and place, uh, I, I mean Bangalore, I mean planet Earth at this time, you know, countries are different one from another, but not all that much especially if we belong to what we like to call the nation of self-realization. We're going to try to find if we can just get some global authority to recognize that, and then we can all just move around this planet without all these other borders. Somehow your Kriya initiation card or your discipleship card qualifies you for this special passport, which is, of course, blue, white, and gold with the spiritual eye right on the center, right? <laughs> Wouldn't that be fun? And there's a special immigration column in every country nation of self-realization <laughs> and we just go through we flash our passports maybe do one Kriya breath to prove that we belong <laughs> they hold up an own board and say what is this used for and you answer and then you can go through <laughs> that's the world we're trying to get into isn't it but all of us it's just it's a really chaotic time in a certain sense to be a devotee in, you know, hundreds of years ago, even if it was difficult, the story of St. Francis and St. Clair. I mean, I'm, many of you may know about that, but St. Clair, St. Francis lived in the town of Assisi. He was the prominent son of a very prominent citizen, one of the richest men in the town. And instead of following in his father's footsteps and becoming a cloth merchant and running the shop, he abandoned it all, and he just moved out into the forest, and he wore rags, and he became a beggar right in the same town. So it wasn't like he went 
to Chennai from here. <laughs> it's like he becomes a beggar. He lives in this house, and then he becomes a beggar in the park. It's just right across the street. And so his poor parents and all the people who expected so much of him, he's just now in rags and eating scraps from a bowl. So there's this woman, Claire, who is also of a very noble family with huge expectations of her than she should marry this one and be that one. And she's completely, she, she looks at this beggar on the street and she sees him in the divine sense. She knows who he is. She knows what he has. And she realizes that it makes everything else worthless. So she runs away. She sneaks out in the night. There's a, an evening party. She dresses beautifully. She's the life of the party. Everyone thinks how gorgeous she is. Everybody's talking about who she's going to marry. And that night, in the dark of the night, she sneaks out of the house. She runs away to where Francis and some of the monks meet her. They take her to a chapel. And of course, this for that time, she has this beautiful blonde hair, and they cut it all off. And once a woman at that time cuts her hair off to become a nun, there's just no turning back because she's changed herself so completely. So she just gives herself to God. And later her father and her brothers, you know, she, she's hidden in this convent and they find her and they, you know, they storm the convent. But she's on the other side of the wall now. And she's cut off her hair. And she just says, no, I mean, imagine. I mean, women did not have freedom to make decisions like that. But nonetheless, there was this reverential fear of God that once a person, especially a woman, had given herself to the cloister, there was also this fear that they couldn't cross. They couldn't violently take her back. Now, on one hand, my gosh, what an act of courage. But on the other hand, then she's safely on the other side of the wall. And now she's part of this life that is done. She knows what she's doing. No more family, no more children, no more job, no more paycheck, no more nine to five, no more cars, no more shopping, no more, you name it. Everything that we all have to deal with. And sometimes a, a, a big part of us just kind of wishes for that, you know, to just become a cloistered nun or an Himalayan yogi or any number of things, instead of what we all are, which is, I live in Silicon Valley. I don't live in a forest ashram. I did for a number of years, but not for a very long time. And even though my work is self-realization, in the sense of that's what all that I do, but nonetheless, I do it in exactly the same context that everyone lives. I drive the car, I go to the grocery store, I deal with everything. So what's being asked of us now is really quite different. And it's, it's, a, it's a dual reality that's very, very interesting. On one hand, it really has to be our inner reality because we don't have the luxury of just putting it on from the outside. We can't just put on the garb of a renunciate, even the garb of the renunciate doesn't look like it used to look anymore. You know, here I am in this blue color. I, was at a, I went to a company and did some seminars there. and It was comical. There was a woman dressed in exactly this color, which I wear it so much now I don't think about it. And all I said was, oh, that's such a beautiful color you're wearing. And then someone, she said back to me, well, it's the same color you're wearing. <laughs> And I said, oh, well, I guess I just admire your taste. What can I think? But even that, we're not recognizable yet for what we're doing. We're not, we don't just shave our heads. We don't just wander off to the Himalayas. So we can just walk through this world and no one will know, not even God, unless we make ourselves known in our own hearts, unless we make ourselves known through our eyes, unless we make ourselves known by the way that we are always giving to others of what the masters have given to us. 
And we do that for a, a number of very good reasons. Master came to America all alone. And now look at all of us. And we're here because of his unrelenting willingness to be an instrument to carry out the mission that Sri Yukteswar and Babaji had given him. Swami Kriyananda, in, at the age of 36, was expelled from Self-Realization Fellowship and YSS. That's not the point of what I'm saying. But at the age of 36, he was penniless without a friend in the world. He was separated from everyone that he knew because everyone that he knew had been involved in what he had now been separated from. He was in the back bedroom of his parents' house, lying on the bed staring at the ceiling with no prospects. And look at us. Because he never let go of his relationship to Master and the responsibility of a disciple to be an instrument of his guru in the world. His way of being an instrument, of course, is very dramatic. He was a fantastic speaker. He, wrote, he sang. He wrote music. He wrote books. I mean, no one in this world rarely sees such a soul. So it's not as if we can be like him in an external way. But we can be like him in the way that gave him the power. And all he had when he was 36 years old in 1962 was his discipleship and his relationship to God and Guru. And absolutely everything that you think of it as Ananda, that you see in the movie, that you experience in your own heart and mind with the poor, poor all of you is all I can say. Swami wrote 140 books. Some of us were there, so we got them one at a time. It was a lot easier. <laughs> Now, you know, you sort of go to read Swami's <laughs> writing like this and you can hardly carry it. But to speak of reading it very quickly, you have to just pick and choose among it. But all he had to make all that happen was, how can I serve you, Master? That's all, that was his only thought. How can I serve you? And Master spoke to him the way Swami Kriyananda needed to be spoken to. And he'll speak to each one of us in exactly the way that we need to be spoken to. And we do it, as I was starting to say, because we have this strange dual reality. On one hand, there's very little form to our lives. Yes, we have this center now. And by the grace of God, I hope in time you have something that looks more like a community. Um, we have one retreat in the whole country of India. I hope we have many retreats in the country of India. Many, many things can happen. Your lives may gradually begin to look a little bit different. But even speaking from my own experience, it'll never look all that different. It's just not the age we live in. Whatever we do, we're going to be half integrated. So on one hand, there is the absolute necessity that we internalize this experience and that we make our self-identity. Just like Swamiji, when that man pulled the autobiography out, I am his disciple. Just like that. You know, somebody wakes you up in the middle of the night and says, who are you? We want to come out of a dead sleep and say, I am his disciple. Just like that, the first identity that comes to us. And the last thing we think of when we die, I am his disciple. Swamiji himself, when asked, you know, how do you want to be remembered? What do you think is the most important thing you, you, done, you have done? He said, I've been a disciple of a great master. He said, that, that's all. Everything else means nothing. So that has to be deeply internalized. And then on the other side, if you do gain benefit from something, whether you have embraced it wholly as your spiritual path or only here receiving inspiration and making up your mind, the way, the way bounty is increased, the way prosperity is increased, the way joy is increased is always by passing it on. Isn't that so? I, it's the very nature of joy to want to share itself. When you feel really, really happy, 
Isn't it the first thing that you do? You're just bounding about, wanting everybody to be happy. Oh, let me fix you lunch. Let me take you out to dinner. Let's go for a walk in the park. You know, I found this wonderful place. Let me take you there. It's just the very nature when that bubble begins to swell is that we know somehow that whatever we're enjoying, we're going to enjoy it more. I, I always smile. I presume it's the same in this country. Yes, I've already seen that it's the same in this country. A woman says to another woman, that's a very nice scarf. And she immediately says, I got it for half price at so-and-so <laughs> store. <laughs> if she did, she always says that. And then it's like, oh, do they have any others? Yes, you could go and buy one. It's like whatever it is, if we enjoy it, we know it's going to be better if we share it. That simple example Swamiji used to answer the unanswerable question, why did God make creation? Everybody always asks, why did God do it? Swamiji says the nature of the divine is bliss, and it's the nature of bliss to want to share itself with all. And then he gives us examples like this. You find a good movie, you call your friend. Because in the passing on of the blessings that have been given to us, that's how we feel the flow, isn't it? A friend of mine, a devotee, complained that he wasn't, he wasn't getting the same results from his practices that he was when he started. And he was advised, and rightly so. It said, well, because you're just holding it all in that cup. And unless you pour some of it out, there's no room for any more to come in. Thank you. And this man, he was so dear, he said, uh, so he tried to go and help at a hospital. That He's an Indian man. And he said it just like this. But I was, I was raised very delicately, and I did, not, I did not know what to do there, he said like that. So he began to think, what did, what did he have to share? And he's a very successful entrepreneur. So he realized that what he had to share was how to help people be a success. And he set up a whole um, just... Uh, activities and ways of just pouring out the blessings that he had received so there was room for more blessings to come in. So we must make this our own. We have to share because that is how we ourselves make space within ourselves for more. And also the act of attuning ourselves to the reality of someone other than ourselves. In, in itself is a spiritual practice. To whom should I, should I, with whom should I share this? How should I share this? What does God want me to do? And all of that is part of the sadhana that expands us. Plus, you know, it's said about Krishna that all of Krishna's soldiers looked like Krishna. And that's such a sweet, um, image and it's been celebrated in, in art and in so many different ways. But it's also a, a profound spiritual truth, which is that the devotees who follow a certain path begin to become, uh, they begin to vibrate with that particular expression of the divine. Swami often spoke of this path as a ray of the divine. It was a beautiful way to say it. It's not the only ray, but it is a specific ray that through the faces and the experiences of these masters, uh, when, the, when the divine comes through, it assumes a certain vibration. And when it comes through master and then through Swamiji, it assumes a certain vibration. And if that is our pathway, then we have to stand in that ray, and we have to align our vibration with that vibration. And there is the internal side of it, but there is also the external side of it, which is they have taken responsibility for a transformation of society and of the planet that seems to be required at this time. In Autobiography of a Yogi, Master talks about Jesus appeared to Babaji and spoke of the necessity to bring back this, these ancient teachings. He writes that Babaji and Jesus together 
have planned the salvation of this age. They are rightly concerned about the increasing technological capacity which can be used for destruction without a corresponding moral development that can balance that destructive potential. Babaji and, and Jesus are concerned about it. And this whole line of, of masters has been sent out of the loving consideration of the infinite for the salvation of each of our souls. Not necessarily for saving our bodies because bodies come and go. When uh, there was a movement in California at one point to ban nuclear weapons, which of course, I think it's a good idea. And they, were, they had a ballot initiative and they were trying to get people would look at Ananda and see us as a, a block of people who could be mobilized for another cause. And so one of the spokespeople came and tried to recruit Swamiji for this um, anti-nuclear initiative. And he presented to Swamiji and a few of us this extremely dynamic presentation about nuclear bombs. And they took a, a, an example city, an American city, and if a bomb of so much power was dropped on the center of the city, um, this many hundreds of thousands of people would be instantly vaporized. There would be no trace of them left. These people would turn to ash and you would be able to find the ashes. These people would die an agonizing death. You know, these people would live and suffer. I mean, it was really gruesome. Concentric circles of death from one bomb like that. When they were finished, <laughs> Swamiji responded first by saying, I deeply appreciate your sincerity. I see that you are really wanting to do a good thing. He said, I don't think it's a good tactic to try to create peace by creating fear. And so he said, you're creating a vibration that is antithetical to the one that you want. Then he said, in a hundred years, he said, almost no one on this planet will still be here. Whether we dribble out one by one over the next century or all go to the astral world at the same time, he said, once we're in the astral world, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, he just took the whole question of who will die and how will they die and what will we do and just wiped it off the table. He said, it makes no difference how we die. What matters is the consciousness we have all the way through life and even in that moment of death. That's what matters at this point. Now, at the same time, you see, our masters are committed, deeply committed, to helping as many individuals as will listen to try to have the right consciousness. Whether it's because cataclysmic events are coming or just because it's always a matter of life and death. You know, whether we think of God or not, that's the only choice we ever have. How do we use this time? How, how much does our life matter? I, I've often, you know, now in movies and so on and death and return experiences, I'm sure you've seen a lot of the same books I have, people who, who go to the other side and have life review and they find out, you know, sort of how their life really mattered. It's really a marvelous exercise to just imagine that you're there. Imagine that you're meeting the angels or the masters that will be there to greet you on the other side. Master said, if you're, if you're loyal to the end, if you persevere to the end, I or one of the other gurus will be there to greet you when you die. Isn't that a fabulous promise? And sometimes I, I try to stand there in front of master and just like, what have I done with my life that would matter to him? It's a very good question, isn't it? That would matter to him. Not that just in the eyes of the world, but that will matter to him. There is a fabulous story about a devotee of Jesus who is a southerner in America. Southerners have a funny way of speaking English to, our, to American ears. And he died uh, in, in the influenza epidemic when he was 20 years old. And he hadn't been a really very nice person. 
he'd been unkind to his parents and a bit selfish in the way he'd lived. And suddenly he was dead. And he said he was in this room and his life review was a movie of absolutely everything that had happened to him from, from, from his conception. He could see his conception from when his soul entered the body all the way to the moment when he passed away in the influenza epidemic. And it was happening 360 degrees around him. And there was nothing he could see that he was proud of. And Jesus appeared because Jesus was the one he loved and just a big being of, being of light. And Jesus said to him, how much have you loved? And he said, I'm just a, I'm barely a kid. You know, I didn't have much chance. I didn't. And, and Jesus said, how much have you loved? And he tried again to defend himself. And he said he looked at that whole panorama. And there was one place over here when he'd been an Eagle Scout and had done something worthwhile. And he said, this is how he described it. He tried to spread his body as far as possible to, to cover up some of the worst parts and like point over here like this. And he said, as he did that, he looked at Jesus and he could tell that Jesus knew exactly what he was trying to do. And he said, this little smile appeared on Jesus' face. And he said, he called Jesus the Savior. The Savior was amused, is how he put it. It amused Jesus that I was trying so hard to pretend. And he said at that moment, he just surrendered completely to both to death, to the presence of Jesus, to the facts of his life, and he, he just stood there in it. And Jesus only wanted to know one thing, how much have you loved? And even the fact that he'd only been a kid was not at all accepted. He had not opened his heart. He had not served the presence of God in this world. And of course, he was sent back and he became a doctor and a psychiatrist and you know did many, 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 many good things and says, you know, the next time I'm not going to be embarrassed. I'm going to be able to just stand there. Now, our masters they built Self-Realization Fellowship. We're building Ananda. We're doing all this stuff. And it's necessary because how do we reach people? They come and visit a place and they meet the people and they feel it. They read a book. They come to a lecture. You know, every one of us, something happens, doesn't it? It's, it's not like we're just sitting there. I mean, maybe for some of you that all by yourself and Babaji materializes in your room. I mean, it can happen, but for most of us it happens in a much more prosaic way. You see a poster, you come to a lecture, you watch something on the internet, somebody hands you a book, and if you trace it back, you know, dozens, maybe hundreds of individual people were all part of that chain. And then the light ignites one more heart and one more heart, and one more heart. Swami Kriyananda was absolutely alone in 1962. And he just started, I'm, I was his disciple. I lived with him for three and a half years. He was the most wonderful man I ever knew. That was, I mean, he did it in a thousand creative ways. But he said, God is within me, and it increases my joy to share him with you. And we have an outward responsibility at this particular time. We are Krishna soldiers in this particular form. And this particular form is a world that is pretty mixed up and doesn't really have a clear sense of direction. And the nation of self-realization is an answer for a lot of people. Think about us. There hasn't been one day since November 1969, when I first saw Swami Kriyananda and made an instant decision that this was my life. There hasn't been one day, and I'm very proud of this fact, when I haven't been absolutely conscious of what a miracle this is. And utterly grateful, on my knees grateful, that somehow, somewhere, I met, I met him at Stanford University, that somebody there decided it was a good idea to invite him. 
and did the promotion and set up the event, and there he was. And if that, of all that chain of people, whoever the heck they were, hadn't done all of that, would I have been there? And my friend, who had met him before, who calls me on the phone, you know, I've met a real teacher, she said, and I think you'll like him. That was the understatement of the generation for me. Yeah, he's a real teacher, and I did like him. And, the, and for that woman, doesn't, I mean, not that she has or has even thought of it, but she could betray me in a hundred thousand ways and it would still be fine. She would still be, the debt of gratitude could never be paid. I, or I've met a real teacher, I think you'll like him. Such a simple thing. I was his disciple, he was the most wonderful man I ever knew. And all of us live such, as this is where I was saying before, we live such chaotic lives. You know, how long will it take us, I said to Neelam, to get from where she lives and we're staying to here. I don't know, 12 minutes, 45 minutes, who knows? <laughs> you just set off down the road and maybe yes, maybe no. Some VIP is going somewhere and the road is closed. She was giving us all the things that could happen. You go to your office, you go home, your aunt, uncle calls you, he needs something from you, your mother, your father, your children, exam time for your children. And all the parents get this incredible shell shock look on their face. No, we can't possibly do anything. It's exam time for our children. I mean, it's just not simple. And that's why we have to actually make our spiritual life very simple. You know, I am, I am the servant of, of God. I am an instrument of a divine cause. And moment, my moment, I don't, I don't live for what I want. I say, okay, God, how can you use me? You've trapped me here in this traffic and I'm not going to get where I need to go. You've held me in this office with this job I don't really particularly want to do, but how can I serve you here? We don't have the luxury of simplicity in an outward way. So we have to develop the luxury of inward simplicity. Just like Swami, he was always ready. He was always ready. No matter what happened, no matter who it was, whenever there was a chance, either just by his vibration or by his words or by his creative work, it was like, can you use me, God? Yes, I'm here to be used. Can I share your bliss? I'm here to share it. And then actually, life gets really simple and also exceedingly interesting because there's just never a time when you can't be busy doing God's work. Even if you're just sitting there quietly, I'll tell one more story and then that'll be enough. This woman um, lived in our center in San Francisco uh, in, in like 1979 and 80. We had a big house there and we had a small store on the other side of town. And that store was open until late at night, like 11 o'clock at night or something like that, 12 o'clock. And she had to get across, the, across town in the middle of the night. She did not have a car. It was not practical for anyone else to take her. She had to take the public bus. And at that time of night, the public bus often had some odd characters on it, people who, other people who were roaming around in the middle of the night. And that bus also had to go through a, a, a less uh, secure area of town in which more and more odd people got on and off the bus. She was talking to Swamiji, and she confessed that she was always a, often a little frightened on that bus, especially when strange people got on the bus. I mean, the bus driver was there, but it still made her nervous. And once he determined that she had no choice, that she really had to do this, he said, just when you get on the bus, he said, choose someone else on the bus and just begin to pray for them. Just ask Divine Mother to bless them, see them surrounded with light, you know, fill their heart with faith in God and see that faith expanding all the different ways. And she immediately started doing that. And in fact, she often prayed for the scariest people on the bus, as she put it. And she said it wasn't long before the bus ride was her absolute favorite part of her day because she got to be so busy and she was just sitting there, apparently doing absolutely nothing except just coming home from work. But God never sleeps. <laughs> He's always there. It's always an opportunity. And that, that is what it means to be on this path. 
is that we must be master's own. I remember, I said that was the last story, but I just remembered one more. At Ananda Village, when we were building our community, some of our neighbors had moved out to that area to drop out of society and disappear. And then Ananda comes in the middle and we're advertising and you know inviting people to come. And we were in a lot of conflict with our neighbors for a long time. And the conflict often centered on the mailbox that we had in front at the end of our road. We would put this mailbox up, Ananda Village, like this. And our neighbors would come and knock it down, smash it, steal it, just do whatever they could. So this one man, his name is Kent White, and he's a, he, he, he's a metal fabricator and a machinist. It became his personal project to build an indestructible mailbox. <laughs> and this kind of, the mailbox war kind of go, went back and forth, and he would escalate, and then they would escalate, and finally he sunk a, a plinth, a pillar, like four feet down in the ground of concrete, and it was pure concrete, and it came up like that in a platform. And then he got this metal box, and he welded and bolted it like this. <laughs> and it held for quite a while. And because of all the concrete, they couldn't knock it down with a car either, because it was just too much. And finally, somebody came and managed to pry the whole thing off, and then drove over it with a car, and so it was just sitting there in this heap. You know, it was, it was awful, but it was also kind of a good-natured competition. <laughs> so on the day that one finally got smashed, which had lasted quite a long time, we would see the evidence of people trying to destroy it. So we knew, you know, that the game was on. And the day that it was finally destroyed, I came to Swamiji and I said, well, they figured it out. And you had to be a little proud of them, too. <laughs> and they were showing a certain perseverance that was admirable. Well, Swamiji, they destroyed the mailbox again. And his house then was the, the dome, which is just the living room, and it was divided with these half walls. And I was up in the kitchen making him dinner. And he had gone downstairs, and he was around behind the partition, sitting at his desk, working at his typewriter at that point. But he, we were still in one room, so we could be heard. So we had talked about the mailbox, and we had laughed about it, because it was just, it was actually fun, you know? <laughs> so they had defeated us again, and what would Kent do now? It was very <laughs> curious. Then Swami goes to work, and I start to work, and then he shouts across the room. He doesn't shout, but he had such a big voice, especially when he was young. Well, Asha, he says, we're trying to transform all of society. And naturally, that will take a little time. He said like that. <laughs> but I've never forgotten that. Because that's what Master came to do. We're trying to transform all of society. Naturally, that will take a little time. But inch by inch, piece by piece, heart by heart, and in the process, we become who we were destined to be as well. So I think that's all I have to say. God bless you. <laughs> OK. I suppose if anybody had a question or two, I would take it before we break for refreshments. Does anyone have a thought that needs to be shared? And you don't have to. <laughs> but if you do, I'll answer. Yes, and tell us about your story, how you got into this path. How I got into this path? When I was um, 18 years old, I was desperate, is the best word for it. I had finished one year of university, Stanford University, very prestigious. I didn't like it at all. I was completely, pretty much actually in despair in a very kind of quiet way because I had already attended this university and they were going to give me knowledge, but they were not going to give me wisdom. And that was very scary to me because I knew that knowledge was not what I wanted and I didn't know where I was going to find wisdom. I didn't even know where it was. I just knew it had to be somewhere and if it wasn't at Stanford, what was I going to do next? Somebody handed me a book by Vivekananda, The Four Yogas by Vivekananda. I, I just remember opening that book and just feeling like, this is it. Somewhere on the planet, 
somebody exists who actually cares about what I care about. And so I immediately became dedicated to Vivekananda and to Sri Ramakrishna. I feel like Sri Ramakrishna was sort of like he took care of me until he could deliver me to where I belonged. And he really did. I never took initiation or anything. None of that occurred to me. So for about four years after that, maybe three and a half years, I studied a lot. And I read all of the gospel of Sri Ramakrishna. Then I started reading uh, books about saints and yogis because I could see that I had this, I still had this big head full of knowledge, but my life was going along exactly the same. I couldn't figure out how to turn that knowledge into a way of life. So I started reading about others who had. I read, uh, I had this job, which I held for three months before they fired me. Um, <laughs> so they fired me. <laughs> They fired me because they perceived that I didn't care at all about the job, that I was just there for the money. And they were a good company, so they wouldn't have someone like me in it. But what happened in that job is I, I ran this machine that was kind of a precursor to a computer for typing and words. It was a legal firm. And they allowed me to read when I wasn't working. And I got Valmiki's big <laughs> thousand page Ramayana, and I read it. I, I was in San Francisco and I read it on the Geary Express bus from my apartment to where I worked. I read it during work. I read it on going home on the bus. I was on the bus once, you know, like this. And, and Sita has been abducted by Ravana and, and Rama doesn't know where she is. And I look up and everybody on the bus is just going about their business as if Sita has not been abducted by Ravana. I was just, I was so frantic. I, I finished that book the day I got fired. <laughs> like the job was just so I could live through that whole story. So I was trying to find it, but I was just lost. And then my friend, who's, to whom I will be eternally indebted, to whom I am internally indebted, her neighbor, went to a class that Swami Kriyananda was teaching. I had tried to read autobiography, but I didn't like it. I was used to Vivekananda, very intellectual, very linear. Here's Master, you know, chanting and praying to Divine Mother, and the Hiri Mahashaya is materializing in a wheat field, and it just like, I didn't know, I couldn't relate to it at all. But she said, he's a real teacher and you'll like him. November, just before Thanksgiving, 1969, I went into this place, they had, it was a tent actually, it was a fraternity house on the Stanford campus. And there were these bleachers, the group I was with wanted to sit as far away from this guy as they could. I would have sat in the front row, but they dragged me to the last row. I'm in the last row, he walked in, he was 43, he was just, he had so much life force, you just, and you'd never seen anything like it. But more than that, he just, he just brought this Divinity is the only thing I can call it. And I, somehow or another, I recognized it. I don't know how. I don't even, I don't know why, but instantly I recognized it. I just recognized that this was it. This was the personification of everything I was reading. It was standing in front of me. And I made a decision before he spoke that this, wherever this man is, that's where I'm going to be. And here I am. Uh, and then I went back, I read Autobiography of a Yogi. Wow, what a great book! <laughs> it was somehow I had to have his vibration because he was devoted and I believed in him completely. Everything else followed from that. And I never looked back. I was a, you know, a hippie, a child of the 60s. We all were. Hari Das can tell you the same stories. Hari Das got there first. Hari Das wandered in. Just, you know, we just kind of wandered in. We didn't know what we were doing. Oh, look, here we are. It's a great place, you know. <laughs> I saw we had so much patience. We were so loony. I mean, it was, it was America. We didn't know anything about this. But we were, I think of it now like this. Actually, God gave me a perception because I was counseling people who were new. Um, this was like, it would have been like 20 years later. 
when I was first where I am now. And I was counseling people who were new and I was trying to help them understand. Suddenly I just, God gave me 1971. He just gave it to me like that. My brain, I had some noodles for lunch. You know how noodles are? They're just all scrambled up with each other. Have you ever seen an Italian pick up one noodle and wind it like that and it just comes out of the mess like that and then he's got this one? That was my brain. <laughs> it was so snarled and scrambled and confused and going this way and that way and undisciplined and just basically nuts in a whole lot of ways. That was my brain. My heart, it was like there was this iron cable and it was straight and it was taut like that. And it just went, it went right to self-realization, it went right to Swami, it went right through Swami to Master, absolutely unwavering. And it was so fascinating to me to see the difference. It was like my soul knew exactly what it was doing. My, my mind, that was a different story. And it, it really helped me because I realized how many people I'm talking to really know exactly what they're doing. And it's just that we're a little confused until we get there like that. No. So that's where so I am. So did you find yourself steady all through these years? I've been steady in the sense that it has and I say, thank you. It has never occurred to me, not even for a minute, to turn away from the path or consider anything else. I've never been tempted by any other path. It's just never crossed my mind not to persevere. Have I been steady in the sense that progress has been all like this? Mm, no. <laughs> How about, you know, <laughs> it's always, it's always a bit of a question mark, and since I've known Haridas and Roma for a long time, how much of our past do we reveal, <laughs> and how much do we just sort of smile <laughs> and just pretend <laughs> that we were born this way? <laughs> when people ask me how to succeed on the spiritual path, I know that I have completely changed. I am like so different just in every few years. The person I am now is just not the person I was. I really don't know how it happens. The only thing I know is don't quit. I'm just really, that sounds so simple. So don't quit the path. Don't quit if the path? Want to quit. Everything, yes, of course. <laughs> you know, do I want to get up early every day? No, never. But, on the other hand, I think I've been very fortunate. I, I just, I've never been tempted. Am I always a good girl? No. Have I gotten into a lot of trouble? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think of Swami holding the end of my kite string. And there's been a lot of wind on that kite at different times, but he always held the end of it. And I always, you know, I, in a sense, had my hand over his holding it. I wanted him always to hold it. But the kite whips around a bit. We all have karma. You know, we just do. And so it doesn't, but it doesn't matter. It makes no difference. That's what I've learned over so these did years. Did you ever think that you made use of the part? Pardon me? Did you ever think that the part you were on, um, it, it spurred you on to do other things? But you had on to it? But you were able to do other things because you were the Absolutely every, I, I wasn't an ambitious person in the sense of I didn't, wasn't interested in anything because I was interested first in happiness. But I had lots of inclinations, lots of inclinations. Every single one of them has found the opportunity to express itself. So if that's what you're asking, God uses you. And if you commit to the divine, the divine makes sure that you untie all your karmic knots. So you don't really have to worry about anything. It'll all happen if you make that first decision. Yeah, I mean, I had politics, law, theater, you know, just anything that I was interested in, I got to do all of it in the context of Ananda. I ran a polit I ran twice, I ran a political movements in our local area. I was involved in litigation for years and helped the lawyers and 
Um, I work with our school. I've been able to do with children, which I wanted to do. I worked with theater a lot in what we've been doing. I mean, you just name it. I've done it all. There's really no piece of my personality or my inclinations that, that Divine Mother hasn't said, oh, look, let's use this for a while. You know? All of it without ever letting go. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. And, I'm, and all these things will come to you. Yeah? Just don't quit. Somebody asked Swamiji, what's your greatest accomplishment? He said that I'm still here after all these years. <laughs> and he didn't mean breathing. <laughs> he meant utterly devoted to my guru. And then he laughed and he said, I never think in terms of my own accomplishments. But yeah, it's a big thing. <laughs>